Um, I'm going to start out with a poem called Stay Little Valentine's Day. And that was really interesting that Matthew mentioned this whole thing. Um, <laughs> it's true. But without community, I wouldn't have known that it was more than me who <laughs> suffered. So this is called Stay Little Valentine's Day. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Each February, I raced home from school, poured the contents onto the floor, sort of second Halloween. I ran my hand over the names of boys, Matt, Dan, Mike, Steve, opened the envelopes they'd licked shut, dissected each dumb pun, the insect imploring, be mine, the scuffed bear pawing the jar of honey, or robots made entirely from car parts, flamethrowers spraying their sparking hearts, ski masked turtles named for Renaissance painters, repelling off the sides of skyscrapers, all signed in a clumsy scrawl. I thumbed each punched out edge, ragged and rough, shook my box of sweethearts, crunched the ones that changed each year, groovy, you win, you're rad, fax me. I saved the classics for last, I love you, marry me. Say yes, the permanent ones. I held them on my tongue as long as I could. I sucked the bits of colored chalk till they dissolved. So one more from childhood. I call this god of longing um, because for me, longing has several senses. I mean, there's the, you know, one that comes to mind immediately, I think, of yearning and heartache, which often comes to mind for me immediately. But also, uh, longing can be um, nostalgia and wistful feelings um, for past memories, and also um, erotic desire. So those are all themes that I kind of try to touch on in this book. So this is a childhood poem, and uh, it's called Abecedarius, and it has 26 lines, each with the next letter of the alphabet. Already, they have decided what he is. He is a boy, barely 12, but to them, he is a cocksucker, a queer, a sissy. Denying it only draws attention. Each day, they teach him a new word, faggot, gay, homo. In the absence of actual proof, these might be idle jokes. Maybe the children are just kidding when they tell him what his lisp that he wants to marry a boy. He learns never to use words that start or end with S. Plurals are out of the question. Things are singular or alone. He quits going outside at lunchtime. Kids throw rocks, scrawl words on his locker. So he goes to the room marked boys at 12 each day, pretends to urinate, then stays in a stall till the bell rings at one. Vaguely, he remembers a time before when he could be here without seeing X-rated drawings of himself on tiled walls. But it was just a year ago. He would be here for a minute at the most, zip up his pants, then go back outside to play. So one of the great things about touring at, I think we're on like maybe our 11th stop or something, um, New York, Boston, San Francisco, LA, uh, has been taking risks. So I've been really enjoying um, reading things I haven't read in public before. Um, and the inspiration often is that, you know, these guys have heard them all. <laughs> so it's been a really growing experience. It's been wonderful. So this is one, I think it's the first time I've read it. And um, I was listening to a lot of Eurythmics songs during the time. This is called Rain. Here comes the rain again. The tsunami came to Japan yesterday. And 5,000 miles to the east, the bay is huge, swaying and gray, an elephant butting its head into the dunes. When the plovers come back tomorrow, they'll perforate the sand in neat little rows, searching for whatever it is plovers eat. I want to walk in the open wind. But it's coming so hard, I have to hold my umbrella like a riot shield the metal legs straining in the squall. 
I should pick up a phone. I should call my sister-in-law. She lost her husband on Friday. I should call my mother, who lost one of her sons. But who does that anymore? Pick up a phone, I mean. We carry them with us. I want to talk like lovers do. The night of the election, I was missing your big kitchen, the seasoned pan, that trick you taught me for cutting onions. The next morning, it was like the poster said, hope. I even thought of calling you. Even forgot about the marriage amendment. My family didn't think to call on me. No one said, it's not fair. I want to dive into your ocean. In the video, Annie Lennox is walking into the sea like Virginia Woolf, or if that was a river, then like James Mason at the end of A Star is Born. MTV wouldn't play her at first, Annie Lennox. They said she looked too much like a man. Is it raining with you? Last week, I saw a seal pup wash onto the shore, a black purse spilling open with opals, rubies, so fresh the gulls hadn't found it yet. They were still squawking downwind around a crowd, and when I came close, they flew off. Their feet had scratched out a wreath of little Vs, each pointing out from the middle, away from the ticking thing, half eaten, half alive. I think I'm going to do two more poems. Um, gosh, you guys are a really cool audience. It's been really fun. And I'm seeing writers I know and writers that I've wanted to know for years getting to meet. So it's been a real pleasure. This is another poem I haven't read uh, before, which is really interesting because it has the line in the title. So it's the eponymous um, line. And uh, so my poem has a lot of uh, pop culture, but I also play with classical illusion mythology stuff, but I try to kind of wink at it. So um, this poem is sort of to, I don't know, kind of wrestle with that stuff, the, how those meet or intersect. Um, it's called Catalog. Some of our best inventories of the Roman gods come from Augustine, who mentioned them only to show how arbitrary the old religion was. Aviona, who watches the child's first steps away from home. Adiona, who brings him back safely. Himeros, god of longing. After school, I would walk to the library to write them down into the thousands, one for every rock and stream, every stage of gestation and kind of sex, until the children found me there, too. The Romans called on four gods to help them remove a particularly stubborn tree, the pruner, the breaker up, the burner, and the carrier away. Too. In Psycho, Janet Lee lies naked and draped on the bathroom floor, a shower curtain in her hand. It is black and white. Her skin is the color of the curtain. The blood is actually chocolate syrup, which is now made from corn. The swirling train fades into a close-up of her eye. She must hold the pose, naked and dripping, for 40 seconds. We watch with our pause buttons, delighting in the twitch of a lid the nostrils slight dilation. The blood funnels counterclockwise because of the Coriolis effect. The lowland Scots call this direction Wittershins, which means against the direction of the sun. But it also sometimes means clockwise. It can mean itself or the opposite of itself, like dust, sanction, and flammable. Three, the walls are never the problem. It is always the roof that needs replacing. In the whorehouses of Pompeii, ashes have preserved frescoes of the various positions available to customers. There were three female prostitutes for every ten men in Pompeii. They were called lupe, wolves. There are also the crouching mothers and the perfect hands of children, but the thatch roofs burned on impact. Four. In the third act of Vertigo, Jimmy Stewart gets thrown off Kim Novak's scent. We are expected to believe this. Her hair is deep bleached and unbun. She wears a pair of thick, ridiculous eyebrows. In real life, Hitchcock wanted to turn her into Grace Kelly, whom he'd lost to the Prince of Monaco. He dyed her hair and taught her to walk like a princess, 
or block of ice he never used her again. In real life, Novak had an affair with Sammy Davis Jr., for which they both received death threats. Five. Scraps of Sappho lie waiting in perfume jars and caves, bits of stored energy, plant, animal. You're still finding them. A nearly complete poem was wrapped around the snout of a small embalmed crocodile. It might have said, I have more than your brackets and asterisks, more than the surprise of pronouns. Six, the goose flesh around your nipples. There's the broken one and the breaker. Sometimes it is that facile. There is someone here who looks just like you. He's got your eyebrows just right, your pigeon-toed walk. I would use him in my next film if he were available. All right, so I'm gonna end with one more poem, and uh, this is a little bit of a shift in tone. Um, a lot of this book was written in San Francisco, and some in Atlanta, and I was living in New York for two years um, when a lot of this book started. And I was flipping through a gay magazine, Glossy, you know, one of those club magazines, um, and I came upon this ad that just, I had to write a poem about. And so I, it's a very non-traditional uh, kind of slogan in the ad, so I chose a very traditional form, the Villanelle, um, which we've uh, heard. And um, this is my um, sort of very unabashed Villanelle. Um, and the title of the Villanelle and the slogan, anal bleaching is all the rage. <laughs> anal bleaching is all the rage. So says the latest magazine, how dearly the world loves a cage. The model's body's bald and beige. His bottom's got a glossy sheet. You know, bleaching is all the rage. They're selling stuff on every page, but really, you know, bleaching cream? How dearly the world loves a cage. Will a pinker sphincter truly assuage your dread that you'll end up a lonely queen? is in a bleaching all the rage. Grand passions get acted out on the world stage. It's clear, even on your TV screen, how dearly the world loves a cage. But don't fret about raising the minimum wage or bringing our troops home. Just print, print, in a bleaching is all the rage. How dearly the world loves a cage. <laughs>